everybody, it's Pastor Matt Roberts from up here at Calvary Baptist Church in Milford. Once again, we're coming to you in a very different sort of way. Uh, there, the church is empty. It's me uh, in here alone recording this. Uh, if you see me looking down a lot, it's because I got the uh, controls to the camera and, and all the sound and stuff right here. Uh, but, but just to give you a quick update, there was a lot going on at your church. I'm going to start with the encouraging news. There was a lot going on at your church. Uh, there was a lot of uh, changes being made as far as the, the structure, the, the building, as far as the sanctuary goes. Uh, so be in prayer for that. When, by the time this is over, we hope to look like a brand new church on the inside as far as uh, what things look like and, and how things are situated. Uh, the second thing I want to go over is we, uh, we're not going to be going back to that imcalvary.online.church. It didn't work for us. Trial and error. That's what we're having to be forced to do. But we will be on Facebook for all of our services including our living room uh, Bible study that I did Sunday, I uh, Monday, excuse me. Uh, I got a, uh, a lot of responses from that. A lot of people really like that. So we're going to be continuing to do that um, as long as the Lord uh, allows us to. Um, also, don't forget this Sunday we will be live. Uh, I'm asking that if you're not an essential part of the church, I don't mean that in, in the negative way. I mean, if you're not the sound guy, the music guy, or a part of the leadership team, we would ask that you worship with us from home. And the reason we would ask that is we don't want anybody getting sick. Um, and so we're asking that if you're not part of the leadership of the church, that you simply stay home and you worship with us virtually. We will be live on Sunday. We will, unless something changes, we will have music. Uh, we will have all the normal uh, things that we have in our service. Uh, so there's that. Uh, also, from what I'm hearing, uh, Easter is still on. So by way of announcements, uh, we are still collecting Easter candy. If you're in the store and you happen to see some Easter candy on sale, grab it, bring it in. We'll put it in eggs. I don't know uh, um, when everything's going to open back up, but from what I'm hearing, the president thinks that the week before Easter, we should be back up and running. If that's the case... <coughs> then Easter Sunday, we will have our Easter egg hunt. If that's not the case, then the week we come back, we will have our Easter egg hunt. Uh, also, by way of announcements, we are not having our fifth Sunday fellowship. I would think that uh, that I wouldn't need to announce that, but I'm pretty sure if I don't, someone's gonna show up here ready to eat after church. Uh, so we are not having our fifth Sunday fellowship. Uh, all right, let's, let's get into this. If you have your Bible, and I trust you do, turn to John chapter number four. If you don't have a Bible, hey, get a hold of me. I'll go get you a Bible, a nice Bible. Uh, I, I will get you one that you can read and you can study with us. Uh, Pastor Eric, he's going to be sending me a video soon, and we're going to put that on Sunday nights. We're going to have all of our normal services, so you need a Bible so you can follow along with us and not just take our word for it. Um, John, 1 John chapter 4, we're going to be looking at the first six verses. It says this, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that confesseth that, the, that not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist, whereof ye have heard that it should come, and, and, and even now already is in the world. Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. They are of the world, therefore speak they of the world, and the world heareth them. We are of God. He that knoweth God heareth us. He that is not of God heareth not us. Hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to virtually gather together in your house. Lord, we, we ask that you be with us. We ask that you guide us during this time. We ask that you be with our leaders, whether they be locally or nationally, Lord. We ask during this time, Lord, that you strengthen our families, you strengthen our, our resolve to be in your house when all this is over, Lord. And I, and I pray, Lord, that you instill in us a need to spread the gospel during this time. Lord, I pray you be with us now. Put your words in my mouth. In your name I pray. Amen. This right here, this is a, a critical passage of Scripture. Uh, and it's, very, it's a very timely passage of Scripture as well. 
It's dealing with false teachers, but specifically uh, those uh, with the spirit of truth or those who have an error-filled heart. And, and, and look at your relationship with God. Because your relationship with God is greatly determined by the leaders or teachers that we're following. If you're following a, a true teacher or a God-called teacher, then your relationship with God is going to flourish more than on a feeling level. It's going to flourish on a spiritual level. If you're following a, a false teacher, not only will your spiritual life suffer, but you will suffer being a step or two away from where God wants you. It, it, it's not a sin to test the spirits. It's not a sin to fact check the preacher or the teacher. It's not a sin to verify what's being taught and how it's being taught uh, by looking at the word of God. As a matter of fact, uh, uh, the authority of scripture demands that we, uh, that we fact check what a man is saying by the authority of scripture. Uh, uh, it's the authority not of man or the tradition of man. It's the authority of what God has to say. It's the, the, the standard we have in the Baptist church is the standard of the Bible. Nothing else. Uh, tradition, the way things have always done, denominational standards, uh, uh, preferential standards, all these are secondary or even third uh, tertiary standards when it comes to the standard of the Bible. If at any time something contradicts the Bible uh, as it's written, not as it's interpreted, then something is wrong and needs confronted in the life of the believer and the church. And here lies the problem with a lot of modern churches. We follow men or the traditions of men. When it uh, and when someone comes along and says, okay, but this is what the Bible says, we have a bad habit of getting all bent out of shape and claiming they're wrong because so-and-so taught us this. But we must test. We must test what's being taught inside of the church by the litmus test that is the Word of God because only the Word of God is perfect. In our first verse, it says this, Beloved, believe not every spirit, by, but try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. We need to be making sure these teachers are of God before anything else. The word beloved here he starts out with uh, tells us something. It tells us that John is addressing people in a tender fashion. He's not talking down to them. He's not belittling them. He's not making them feel like he's smarter than them. And we also see that he's not just addressing a bunch of random people here. Uh, uh, John is addressing Christians. Uh, and, and that, yes, this tells us that true Christians can be misled by false teachers. And if we look at the landscape of the modern church, we can see case after case uh, where, yes, we have been led astray by false teachers. And that's because a false teacher may look like a true teacher. Uh, they may have the spirit of light, so to speak. They, they may seem to be speaking truth about how to live your best life now. Uh, this false teacher may seem intelligent and full of knowledgeable uh, and, and interesting ideas in his teachings. He may even be showing you how to lead a good life or develop yourself or be satisfied or be educated, feel good, or get recognized. He may ever even have a, a form of righteousness. He may speak and teach and preach righteousness in everything he does. He will probably stress things that are important to a believer like morality, goodness, ministry, giving, serving, and helping others. He may even stress that the life of Christ and, and the traits and characteristics should be characters of characteristics of the people of God. He may tell people to live like Jesus. Or he may tell people to treat others how, how Jesus would treat them. But these teachers make a big mistake, which we're going to talk about in detail here in a second. Uh, but they don't follow the Christ of the Bible. Instead, a false teacher, even if they say the name Jesus, even if they have a Bible, even if they claim they're of God, uh, a false teacher doesn't follow the teachings of the Bible. Instead, they follow the Messiah or the teachings of somebody else. They don't follow the Bible as it's written. Here's a problem with mass interpretation of the Bible is a lot of people have decided they can interpret the Bible however they see fit. And that mentality is, is what has and what will continue to lead so many astray. Remember on Sunday morning, our study of Galatians uh, uh, in chapter 1, verse 6, it says, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. Obviously, we're having some sound issues, so I'm going to go ahead and apologize 
uh, for that, excuse me, uh, but I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of God and to another gospel. And if we're honest here, preference has usurped the gospel in so many churches today, in so many Christians' lives today. Listen, I, I don't, I don't get, I don't, I, I get it. I understand that so many people they they want this or they desire this or they think this. But listen to me: if it's not written in the Bible, then it's not a doctrine. We have this influx of people today who are teaching doctrines, but they're teaching doctrines that are man-made doctrines. They're teaching doctrines that, that somebody came up with one day because they preferred it this way. Here's the cold hard fact for you. Where the Bible speaks, we Christians need to be very loud. But where the Bible is silent, we need to shut our mouth and start listening to God. But we need to test what the teachers have to say. In verse 2 and 3 it says this. Hereby know ye the Spirit of God, every spirit that confesseth. That Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God, and every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist, whereof ye have heard that it should come, and even now already is in the world. What a teacher professes about Christ is the difference between a true and a false teacher. It exposes their spirit. It exposes if they are a true or false teacher in all aspects. And see what's specifically talked about here. It's talking about the incarnation. Did Christ come in the flesh or not? Did the God of heaven and earth come to earth in the form of man and live and die for you and me? That's important. A true teacher says, yes, he did. A true teacher will teach that Jesus was more than just a good man. A true teacher will teach that he's the son of God. He's God in the flesh and he's the savior of all mankind. A true teacher is someone who comes under the uh, calling and the leading of the Holy Spirit and will proclaim the entire gospel. What is the gospel? In a nutshell, it's that Jesus is the Savior, the Messiah, and the Anointed One. That He's the one that was foretold of in the Old Testament to come and save man from sin. That He lived, He died, and He rose again. Now I'm talking about someone uh, who isn't, I'm not talking about someone who simply regurgitates old nonsense that they were taught, but they don't really believe. I'm talking about a God called, God sent teacher who's coming in the spirit to edify the church and tell lost people about the Savior. I'm not talking about what we see more often than not in a lot of churches is a mama called, daddy sent, grandpa affirmed teacher who doesn't know anything for himself. He only regurgitates what someone else told him. You can't teach something that you don't know for yourself. And you don't know something for yourself if you're simply following other men. But when you follow the word of God and you study the word of God and you read and you learn from the word of God, you can then teach the word of God. Looking at the landscape of, of so many modern teachers, you see that they just rehash old stuff, somewhat, sort of like an old game of telephone. And I don't know if you played telephone when you were a kid or not, but I did. And what happens in a game of telephone is somebody always adds something or subtracts something. They don't always do it maliciously. Sometimes they do it accidentally. Sometimes they do it just to see what will happen. But just in case you were wondering what's been lost in the game of telephone, that is the teachings in the modern church, what's been lost is real doctrine. What's been added is legalistic or non-repentance doctrine. Listen, a false teacher is one who denies the incarnation of Christ. He denies that Jesus is God in the flesh and he denies that God became man to save men. They say things like he was a good moral teacher, but that's about it. They teach that there are other ways to God but through the Savior. They say the Bible isn't the inspired word of God. And what is foretold isn't true. They say he was a religious figure. But that's about it. And this is a fatal, a fatal or a damnable mistake by false teachers. 
They don't teach the truth of his messiahship, his ability to save, or his ability to save men from sin. They don't teach that he's the only way to the Father, and that they, they teach that you can make your own way to heaven. They don't teach that the truth of the Bible uh, being the word of God, so they have no authority. Uh, they don't teach the sin substitute that happened on the cross. These false teachers, they don't teach the truth of Christ. I could go on and on, but that one sums it up because they're, because of that, their, their mistake is fatal or deadly in a spiritual sense. False teachers don't teach the gospel. They may teach a form of gospel or sort of a gospel message. And it may even sound like the gospel to someone who's unlearned in what the gospel is. But if the whole gospel, if the whole gospel isn't preached, then it isn't the gospel at all. And it has no power to save and it has no power to transform lives. Look at this with me. Matthew 15 verse 9. It says this. Uh, it says, but in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. So many today are worshiping in vain. Because they follow men, not the Holy Spirit. And the teachers of God's word, they don't get listened to. People want the big crowds. There's nothing wrong with a big church. There's nothing wrong with having a church house packed. There's nothing wrong with having a 2,000 seat auditorium. There's nothing ungodly about that. But people crave acceptability. And more often than not, not every time, but more often than not, a man will compromise for people. They'll start teaching the commandments of men. They'll start teaching the preferences of other men. They'll start teaching the preferences that they were taught that was passed down to them. They'll start teaching the things that they know aren't truth. And they'll tell their lies so much that they'll eventually start believing that, that what they're saying is the truth. And those people are worshiping in vain. Their worship doesn't even reach the top of the building. Church house after church house has went one way or the other. They've either went ultra legalistic or ultra, uh, ultra, ultra, uh, uh, everybody gets to go to heaven. Non-repentance, excuse me. The ultra-legalistic ones, they, they say you got to walk like me, talk like me, act like me in order to go to heaven, uh, even though I'm not the Savior. The non-repentance churches, they teach that it doesn't matter what you do, but you never have to accept because everybody goes to heaven. But right smack in the middle, I'm going to use a church word, a Baptist word for you. Right smack in the middle, there's a remnant of churches still standing by the Bible, still holding on to the truth of God's word, still preaching the absolute authority of the word of God and not wavering to the commandments of men, whether the commandments of men be ultra legalism or whether the commandments of men be ultra non-repentance. So many worship in vain. But we need to be a people who worship truly. And how do we do that? Test yourself. In verse 4 of our text it says, Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. This is a verse that uh, is, is often quoted a portion of it. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Uh, and it's quoted for good reason. If you're saved, if you're saved, you have the Holy Spirit of God living inside you. And greater is that spirit than any spirit that's in the world. But you've got to ask yourself some things. Number one, have you been born of God? Because if you've not been born of God, you don't have that Holy Spirit of God living inside of you. If you have, that's great. I'm glad. And I hope everyone listening is born again or born of God. But now ask, are you overcoming the false teachers? Now, I know that if you're saved then the spirit of God is in you. And that spirit of God is stronger than any spirit of false teaching. And having his spirit in us or the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in us, uh, having that, we're able to overcome these false teachers and these false teachings. But we have to reject these false teachings in order to overcome them. And we have to confront false teachers and their teachings. Here's the sad thing. Most Christians don't want to work. They just want to sit back and enjoy the show. Confronting false teachers and false teachings, it can be hard because 
False teachers are usually persuasive. They're usually very personable and very appealing and, and usually full of charisma. And their ideas sound reasonable and appealing as well. But if a person is truly born of God, then the Spirit of God will help them see the error of these false teachings uh, and these false teachers. And listen, if we are willingly sitting under false teaching, then we are affirming that the teaching is, we are affirming the teaching and we're guilty of it as well. We don't ever need to be a, to people who attack or split churches over preference. I know a guy, I'm not going to name names, so I don't, you know, it's not my business to name names right now, but hey, listen, I know a guy, he has split about every church he's been in. That's not what a Christian is supposed to do. We don't need to be attacking people or splitting churches over preference. But you know what we do need to do? We must be a people, an able people who will confront in a loving spirit false teachers and lead false churches if they don't see the truth of the situation and put away false teachers. I've left churches over false teachings. And guess what? That's a biblical reason to leave a church. I have, in the spirit of love, confronted teachers and preachers over this. And guess what? That's okay, too. But what's not okay is sitting idly by and letting false teachers teach false things about Christ. Christian, we need to stand up and we need to confront these false teachers and these false teachings and we need to get them out of our church houses. But sadly, most Christians will sit by as long as their ears are getting tickled. They'll sit by and they'll enjoy these false teachings. In verse 5 and 6, it talks about testing the followers of these false teachings. It says, that they that are in the world, therefore, they are of the world, excuse me, therefore speak they of the world, and the world heareth them. We are of God. He that knoweth God heareth us. He that is not of God heareth not us. Hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. False teachers are followed by people who are more interested in the world than they are of God. And guess what? The worldly people will hear a worldly message because a worldly message appeals to them. They crave this type of teaching because it, it tells them that their man-centered false belief systems are true. They can make rules and, and, and stuff like that that works for them. And they can set boundaries that work for them. And what God has to say comes after what they have to say. And that's affirmed in their false teaching churches. If we stumble here and there, that's okay. We don't have to get right when we look at holiness from the standpoint of man-centeredness. This type of worship is vain worship. This type of worship also excuses sin, exalts man, builds ego, builds self-image, and gives more importance to man than God. This type of false teaching, it focuses on us. True teachers are followed by people who know God. This is a thriving people spiritually. This is a people who are walking daily with the Savior and growing together as the local church. They aren't repressed spiritually. And they are encountering God daily in our lives. I said a couple weeks ago that we need to quit looking at our relationship with a God as a, as a one-time encounter on an altar or on a back porch somewhere. But we can have daily encounters with God through the Holy Spirit. But not if you're sitting under false teaching. These people sitting under true teaching, they aren't chained down by sin or law. Meaning their sin has been repented of and the law has been put aside for grace. So many people today think false teachers are just liberal or, or, or whatever. But the truth is there are teachers who are teaching falsehoods on both sides of the doctrinal aisle. I'm a conservative person politically, but I'm not a Nazi. I know people who are liberal politically, but they're not communists. Like everything else, there has to be balance. Our doctrine must be balanced on the authority of the Bible. I said it before and I'll say it again. Where the Bible speaks, we must speak. Where the Bible is silent, we must be silent. We don't need to be doing theological gymnastics through a passage to make it work to our narrative. We need to read the Bible and take the Bible as it's written and follow God as he's called us to follow him. We can know, we can tell how a teacher is by looking at those who follow him. 
And we can tell how a teacher is by looking at what he teaches. We can see how we are uh, by what we are doing. So realistically, ask yourself this question. Are you a Christian? If not, you need to get that settled. If so, then good. But ask yourself this. Am I standing against false teaching? Or am I just going with the flow? Christian, I don't know where you're at today. Lost person, I don't know where you're at today. But I know this. God is seeking to save those who will answer his call. And God is also seeking to use those who will answer the call to be used. But we have to stand up. We have to be growing spiritually. And we'll never grow spiritually past where we are today if we're sitting under false teaching. I'm going to close this video out. But when I close this video out, won't you pray? Won't you ask God to show you the truth?